Hi there, my name is Justin. Welcome to our plastic series. And as I'm filming this message, it is September 2022, which means one thing and one thing only, time to break out your autumn winter wardrobe. Oh yes, get those coats back out. Here's my prediction for fashion this year. It looks like this chunky, chunky knitwear because nobody will be able to afford to put the heating on. We will be wrapping ourselves up and trying to resist paying the gas bill. Ah, let's have a little bit of look at fashion through the ages. I wonder if you were young and trendy, or, or just young, in the 70s. If you were, were you wearing the platform boots, the bell bottoms, or the sleeveless vest? I wonder if you recognize any of those. Were you young and trendy in the 1980s? So here's my question. Were you hip hop style? Or were you high waists? Were you high waisted on your jeans? Children of the 90s, particularly women, although men too, the choker. It was all about the choker. Or if you were a bit more refined than wearing a choker, it was all about the little black dress. There we go, as modelled by Princess Diana. Okay, moving on to the 2000s, where you young and trendy in 2000, it was all about the denim. There's Britney in the denim for us. And of course, you know the rules of double denim? It's gotta be the exact same tone or completely opposite. Don't be doing navy blue, light blue. It's gotta match or it's gotta contrast. Uh, or if you weren't into the denim, maybe you were into the rhinestones. Ah, oh, the rhinestones. And if you had a rhinestone belt over your double denim, you were fully protected from the millennium bug. Moving on to the 2010s, and it brought us the skinny jeans. Oh yes, the skinny jeans. And those of us who are just under 40 are not too sure whether we should stay skinny or go baggy again. We are caught in a high mid-waist crisis. But anyway, moving on to the fashion for 2020. It's all about the ankles. What is that about? I was in a staff meeting last year and as I, uh, we were all standing in a circle praying and as I looked around I realised I could either see the socks or the ankles of every single staff member who was younger than me. I went home to Liz, I was like, Liz, we have to roll up our jeans now. This is, this is what the kids are doing. Somehow our ankles have got to be on display. Uh, but then I finally made it into the height of fashion this year when for my birthday, my nephew gave me some sliders. Oh yes, sliders and socks. Boom, there we go. That was your fashion tips for autumn, winter 2022. Keep yourself warm and get your ankles out. We are in a series called Plastic where we're asking, is it me, myself and I, or is Jesus Lord? In a world where self is king, where the highest order of truth is, is what you find inside of yourself, where your identity is something that you look inside and you listen to what you're telling yourself about yourself and how you think and you feel, and then you bring that out and present it to the world to be celebrated, and in this series, we're just taking a moment to go, is that really what it means to be human? Is that the best way to live? Or, or does the Bible call us to something else? Because actually we believe the Bible calls us not to be self-centered, but to be Christ-centered. If I asked you to uh, introduce yourself and tell me three things about you, what are the three things that you would say? I hope you're thinking and talking to yourself or the person you're watching this with. Coming up with three things that you would say. I'd say to you, Aunt, my name's Justin. I work in a church. I'm married to Liz. I've got two children. Um, I might get to, you know, I, I like coffee. I, I think I'm funny. I'm slightly melancholic. But... I wonder the things that you thought to introduce and describe yourself, were they things that were intrinsic to you? Like, I'm happy, I'm creative, I'm funny, I'm sarcastic, I'm miserable, I'm troubled, I'm delightful. 
Or were they more things about how you relate to the world around you? Did you say, would you say what your job is, what your position in your family, a role or status that you hold in life? I'm, I'm a journalist, a politician, a pastor, a minister, a teacher, a nurse. You see, even though we believe we believe that identity is something that is found inside of us, we do know that actually we also find our identity socially. We find it in how we relate to other people. Who we are to other people does form so much of our identity. I think that's what fashion is about. We're trying to align ourselves with, with a group of people. We're trying to express our own unique individuality and then find a load of other people who are different just in the same way as us who express their uniqueness exactly like we do. We want to find the crowd, the tribe where we fit in. Where, where do we get our identity from? Well, if we're a follower of Jesus, then we're living in a bit of a culture clash at the moment. And it's a clash between what we would call a, a mimetic view of the world or a poetic view of the world. Now, don't, don't switch off, stick in with me. It's not confusing, I promise. If you really want to dig into this, you should look at the work of Carl Truman. The Rise and Triumph of Modern Self is a brilliant but difficult book, but he also wrote Strange New World, which is a little bit easier to read. So if you want to make it easy on yourself, have a look at Strange New World. But the needs to know are this. A mimetic view of the world comes from this idea of mimicking. This idea that Actually, there's something beyond this world that this world is, is, is imitating, is mimicking. There's a pattern that's been set by a higher order that we are trying to follow along. That actually we're not defined by, by ourselves, but there's something else above us, beyond us that we can't see. But it's that that we reference. That's a mimetic view of the world, that we're following a pattern that a creator has set. A poetic view of the world is this idea that actually this is it. There is nothing beyond this. There is no higher power. There is no universal truth. So it's down to you to just create who you are, to, 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 to decide what you want to be and to make of yourself and this world the best that you can. You don't need to worry about copying or following a pattern. In fact, don't copy or follow a pattern. You do you and don't let anybody dictate to you who you should be. In this series, we're looking at the book of Philippians. And I want to zone in on, on one line that Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 17. He says this, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul says to the church, he says, brothers and sisters, listen, come together and copy me, follow me and watch to see who else is patterning their life in the same way that I am so that you can replicate, you can imitate, you can mimic me. In our world, we, we don't like this idea of mimicking, this idea of imitating, this idea of copying they're not really positive words to us. It makes us think of uh, cheap fakes or uh, replicas or things that aren't authentic. We, we don't like imitations unless we shop in Audi. Other cheap supermarkets are available. But if we shop in Audi, we love imitations because Audi has built its entire business model on ripping off products from other superstores and selling them cheaper. So, you know, the joy of 2021, free Cuthbert. When Marks and Spencers decided they were fed up of Audi copying their Colin the Caterpillar cake and sued them to try and stop them making Cuthbert the Caterpillar and selling it for half the price. But generally, we don't like imitations. But in the New Testament, it calls us to imitate seven times, and each time that word is a positive. So here's my central thought for you today. You were made to imitate. You, you were made to imitate. 
that's why I think fashion and trends are a thing. Uh, that's why I think we can get caught along with society and ways of thinking and just accept things without questioning because we, we were made to follow along. We were made to copy something. We were made to imitate. If you're a parent watching this, maybe you know what I mean. Because we promised ourselves, didn't we? When we were children or teenagers, we promised. We, we had that moment with ourselves and we said, when I'm older, when I become a dad, if I become a mum, when I get to be the grown up, I'm not going to do it like that. I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to say the same things. I'm not going to insist on the same things. I'm going to be different. And then you have that horrendous moment where you're dealing with your own children and suddenly you open your mouth and you hear those words you heard from your dad. Or you're insisting on the same rules that your mum insisted on. And as you're doing it, you know it's the right thing, but there's a little bit inside of you dying because you're like, oh no, I promised I wouldn't follow this. More and more, there's a 17-year-old Justin inside of me shaking his head, going, you promise, man, you're a sellout. Because you try not to, but you follow the pattern you have been set. And my challenge is I think you will copy something. You will imitate something. Society will shout at you, be yourself. But you know, it will put very strict boundaries around what that should look like. And if you dare step outside those boundaries, you'll be cancelled. You're actually not as free to be as individualistic as you think you are. Because we were made to imitate. In Johnny's first message, he showed how Paul kind of evokes this idea of the creation story when he was telling us that it's God's job to do the work in us and our job to let him do it. But if we go back to that creation story, we find in Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. You are made in the image of someone else. Not because you're a cheap knockoff, not because you're inauthentic, not because you're a boring replica, but because the creator of the universe has chosen for you to carry the same image. You were made to imitate God. You were made to follow in the pattern that he has set and true freedom and true you being you is not you copying yourself or anybody else around you but you imitating the one in whose image you were made you were made to imitate and you will copy something the question is what are you imitating so we come back then to Paul's call to the church in Philippi to imitate him if we're followers of Jesus and we're saying, actually, I want to pattern my life after him. I want to be like Paul and imitate the one who made me. How does that look? Let's read through a bit of this passage together. So verses 7 to 10. Paul says, I, I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when I'm compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. So what is Paul asking us to imitate? What is the pattern that he is setting for us to follow? If we don't want to just mimic the world and be swept along with culture and society, then what is it about our lives that should be patterned after Jesus? Well, 
there is lots in this chapter and in this book that you can pull out. And I am by no means going to even scratch the surface in our time here. There's loads to pull about pressing on and not giving up. There's loads to pull out about being a citizen of heaven and having your eyes fixed on the things above. There's lots about counting Jesus as more valuable than anything else. But there's just two things I want to pull out. And maybe you can dig for the rest in your own time or with your group or your team or whoever you do life with in the coming week. Verse 7, Paul says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless. What things? What things did Paul used to think were valuable that now he knows aren't? Well, it might surprise you, but Paul is speaking to his religious pedigree. He's speaking to the fact that he was a highly religious man, that he, he was a Jew, a strict follower of Jewish law, a Pharisee, a scholar, somebody that other people would have looked up to and gone, the way he behaves, he follows God's law to the letter. What does this mean for us? I guess my challenge would be in, in our imitation of Jesus, are we actually imitating him or are we just getting religious? You know, we can say, well, we're not creating ourselves like the world are. We're, we're imitating something, but are, are we imitating what we think other religious people should be thinking we should be doing? Paul's journey will tell us that you can be zealous and passionate for God and manage your behavior as hard as you can and yet still not know who God is. See, if society shouts, look inside to find yourself, religion would shout, look around and make sure you're doing better than other people to find yourself. But actually, Paul is calling us to go, actually, it's not about your own achievements. It's not about how good you can be for God. It's about finding yourself in what he has done not in what you can do. Let me nudge us even closer to the line of uncomfortability. Where does the value come in your spiritual life? What are the things that you lean on to know that, oh yes, I'm following Jesus because I've watched church today, or I've read my Bible, or, or I've prayed, or I've been to my group, or I've served on my team? Well, yeah, those things alone, they're actually not valuable. They're only valuable in as much as they remind you that this is all about what Jesus has done. That they're only valuable if they help you get your eyes off yourself and fix your eyes on him. But if they're the things that you rely on to go, oh, okay, well, yes, no, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm following what God would want me to do. Well, actually, you might just be imitating religion and not following Christ. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says some interesting things that appear that he's setting the bar for behaviour higher. But actually, he's not. He's just moving the transformation. Here's what I mean by that. He says to them, you have heard it said, the law says don't murder, but I tell you, don't speak out of anger to a brother or sister. He says, the law says don't commit adultery, but I tell you, if you've lusted after someone in your heart, you've already. It sounds like Jesus is asking for more effort. It sounds like he's making it even harder for us, but he's not. He's moving the transformation. He's saying this is not about just your external actions of don't kill anybody or don't have affairs. He's saying, no, no, this is about allowing me to transform who you are on the inside. This is not about your own efforts to manage your behaviour. That's not what it looks like to follow Jesus. As Johnny said in week one, it's God's job to do the work. To imitate Jesus, we allow him to come in and transform our hearts. So often in church and so often with religion, we get ourselves into trouble because we say, well, well, copy us. Keep our standards of behaviour. Wind your neck in and be like everybody else around you. 
that's not what Paul is saying. When he's saying imitate me, he isn't saying copy all of my behavior. He's saying, no, 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 imitate me in allowing Jesus to transform who you are. It's not based on your efforts. Imitate me by trusting in him alone. And the more we look to Jesus, the more we put all of our value into who he is, then we start to find he's transforming who we are. Second thought from this passage to pull out that Paul's asking us to pattern along, to imitate, to follow him in. Verse 10, it says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. You know, Paul has no problem with his life circumstances. You know, at this point, as he's writing, he's, he's in jail. He will say later on in this book, I can do all things through Christ. We love that scripture. But the context of what he's saying is, he's saying, listen, I've learned how to live really well when I've got loads of money. And I've learned how to live really well when I've got nothing. Whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor. Whether life's going well or whether life's going terribly. Whether I am as free as a bird or I'm a jailbird. I can do all things through Christ. But Paul is saying his external circumstances don't affect how he feels about his identity in Christ. He says, I want to know his resurrection power and I'm happy to suffer with him too. Do you know, I'm, I'm not there. I do find when, when things don't go well or how I expected them to be, I kind of go into a bit of a spiritual identity crisis. My God, are you still who you say you are? Are you still with me? Have you abandoned me a little bit? I went to a coaching network for church leaders a few months ago and they opened with this worship song, God, you've been nothing but good to me. And I was kind of gritting my teeth going, well, I know this is true, but actually, God, I'm not feeling it. Actually, God, I've, I've got some feedback for you, and uh, I think you could do better. There's a few areas in my life, God, where I'm not actually convinced you're being good to me right now. I'm, I'm going to give you a C- minus in this area, God. And you, we know that God is good. But, but when life comes against us and it's difficult and we find ourselves being a little bit shaken and going, God, I'm just not sure if you're still good and I'm not too sure if you actually love me that much. It's telling us that maybe our identity isn't actually that fixed in him. Paul says, I found myself in Christ, which means whether I'm in a prison or whether I'm out preaching to thousands, I'm good. I know who he is. Actually, none of those things are of any value. I just want to know him because in him, I find my identity, not in my own efforts, not in how my life is going, but in who Jesus is. I find in our modern society, you know, our, our self-made identities don't seem to be very robust. If anyone challenges how we feel about ourselves or all the world, then we'll, we'll kind of want to cancel them. And I'm not talking about oppression or treating people badly or hating people or tearing them down. But I am just saying if we're that sure who we are, then we should be able to take a robust conversation about that. But, you know, if we're a follower of Jesus, it's not our business to be thinking about the world's identity how robust is our identity in Christ? Or are you a little bit like me? When life doesn't quite go how you want, we find ourselves having a little bit of a wobble. And Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, listen, pattern your lives after mine. Whether it's going great or whether it's going terribly, find yourself in Christ. Get your identity from him, not from what you can do, not from how your circumstances are, but in him and him alone. Last scripture 
for us to wrap up on. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus says this, Come to me, all who are labour and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The world would say, look inside yourself, discover who you are, and then bring that out to be celebrated. Religion would say, look around yourself and make sure that you're doing better than all those around you. And Jesus would say, that just sounds like a lot of hard work. That's a lot of hard work and you are gonna get weary. Why don't you come to me? Find out who you are in me. Let me put my burden on you. Let me put my yoke upon you and you'll find that it is easy and light and you will find rest for your souls. Let me transform you from the inside out. Let me make you so secure in who you are that it doesn't matter how things are going around you. You will know who you are because you will know whose you are and you will be following the pattern that I have set for you. And maybe if you're just a little bit tired with trying to be you, and maybe you're a little bit tired with trying to keep up with everybody around you, why don't you come to Jesus and see what it's like to find out who you are when you find yourself in him. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for our message. If there was something that resonated with you or you want to explore a little bit more about Jesus, then go to renewalcc.com forward slash next steps. You can fill out the form there and we can connect with you. Also, if you have a question for the team or you just want to say hello, then you can get in contact with us at hello at renewalcc.com and one of the team will be in touch with you. Also, we want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also go to renewalcc.com forward slash media where you can find our Spotify and Apple podcast channels where you can find all our messages and all our online content and there's a new episode being released every Monday. Finally, if you like the work that we do, you can also donate to Renault. If you go to renaultcc.com forward slash give, you can find all the ways in which you can give into the life of Renault. But thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.